Again, as you can see from my uh, title slide, we're going to talk about adult idiopathic scoliosis, or ADIS. I'm going to present a, a new classification system that we're working on and, and how this uh, leads to uh, various treatment recommendations for these, uh, for these patients. Uh, I want to also acknowledge that James Lynn, a fellow with us last year, actually Columbia resident, a Columbia fellow, and then now at Mount Sinai, but he did, he's helped me with this uh, and did a lot of the case reviews to come up with the criteria that we, you'll see we use for determining structurality of, of the various curve types in this system. So thanks, to, shout out to James Lynn, did a great job. My disclosure is probably most relevant. I do uh, receive substantial royalties from Medtronic for uh, IP of uh, some of the equipment you'll see uh, being used in these cases. So when we were thinking about uh, developing a ADIS classification system, this criteria that we had was to number one, uh, have it be radiographic 2D, which is still the main means of communication amongst all of us. Obviously, you know, we do often get 3D images and uh, talk about the 3D correction of spine deformity, but uh, we still communicate and uh, really uh, diagnose and, and treat patients mainly off 2D x-rays, AP and laterals. We wanted to make it simple, reliable. Um, to do that often, uh, uh, having uh, be modular, as I learned from the AIS system, is very nice. So we're, uh, it's easier to remember, and also it's nice that you can add other components in the future if we'd like. So you'll see this is a modular system. Uh, and it would be nice if it was familiar, as we know, uh, uh, ADIS evolves from AIS. So uh, we have a well-accepted uh, uh, um, system now for almost 20 years of AIS classification. So you'll see we leverage that well-known system into the ADIS system. Um, uh, because of the familiarity that uh, many people may, will have with that system. So the, again, the AIS system published uh, JVGS 2001 uh, that really again has this triad component of uh, one of six curve types uh, uh, added to a lumbar spine modifier A, B, or C, added to a sagittal thoracic modifier minus center plus to give the complete curve classification. As an example, a 1B plus would be a main thoracic curve with a B modifier that's hyperkyphotic. So for AIS, uh, the reason we have the six curve types is that we divide the spine into three regions that become structural in, in AIS. It's the proximal thoracic, the main thoracic, and the thoracal lumbar or lumbar. And those regions can be either uh, um, uh, structural uh, uh, curves, non-structural, and uh, the major curve being the largest curve. And so that's how we came up with six curve types, noting, working with those three regions. What's different about ADIS is that we must pay attention to the lumbosacral fractional curve that often has uh, uh, implications for structurality, also implications obviously for, for treatment um, and often things like stenosis and, uh, and the concavity uh, uh, as far as what patients present with. So we wanted to incorporate the lumbosacral region into this um, classification system. In, in, in addition, uh, as we all know, once we start doing especially uh, long constructs in the adult, uh, the key is to have the patient with optimal uh, coronal and sagittal balance. Uh, so it's not only regional curve correction, you know, in, the, in the adolescence, we're mainly, mainly interested in regional curve correction because most of these patients aren't balanced in the coronal and sagittal plane. But in the adult, often they come in with imbalanced curves and our goal is to rebalance them. So we wanted to have some type of balance component to the system. So the ADIS triad system consists of three, these three components. Number one, curve type one through six. As you'll see, this is going to be the exact same curve types in the AIS system because they have the exact same curves. They're just older and often more degenerated. But, uh, but we're going to uh, use the same six curve types. Number, the first modifier, though, is going to be the lumbosacral modifier, whether it's non-structural or structural. And we'll uh, talk about that. It's based on the supine AP x-ray. And the next modifier, the third component, will be a global balance modifier. And you'll see there's four options there based, again, on the coronal and sagittal global balance of the patient that's presenting. So looking now specifically at the curve types, so here are the six curve types. Again, the same six curve types that uh, we have in AIS. The difference being that we're going to determine the structural criteria uh, of the uh, minor curve by using supine x-rays, supine APs instead of side benders. So that's kind of the main difference between the AIS system. So as you can see, the structural criteria for a proximal thoracic curve will be a residual supine cob of greater than or equal to 35 degrees or T2 to T5 kyphosis greater than or equal to 20 degrees, as again, is in the AIS system. 
for uh, main thoracic curves, again, it'll be supply and cob greater than 35 degrees, or T10 to L2 kyphosis greater than equal to 20 degrees, and the same for thoracal lumbar and lumbar uh, curves. So again, we're really switching the 25 degree rule on side bending for a 35 degree rule on supine imaging for the uh, uh, adult patient. So here's an example. Uh, on the far left is the AP upright x-ray showing again a 18 degree proximal thoracic, 55 degree main thoracic, 25 degree thoracal lumbar um, uh, com measurement. The, the middle is the supine x-ray, where again the proximal thoracic curve is 22, main thoracic goes down to 35, and um, thoracal lumbar is 18 degrees. In the sagittal plane, again the T2 to T5 kyphosis is 11 degrees, T10 to L2 is 13 degrees. So this is a type 1 curve. Only the main thoracic region is, is structural. The minor curves above proximal thoracic and lumbar are non-structural in both the coronal and sagittal planes. So it's a type 1 main thoracic adult uh, curve. Here's an example of a type four triple major adult curve. Again, you see the far left x-ray is the upright x-ray, the middle is the supine, and the far right is the lateral. You see um, uh, in the middle x-ray, the residual proximal thoracic curve is 36 degrees, which makes it structural, it's greater than 35 degrees. Uh, and the thoracal lumbar and lumbar res uh, residual supine cob measurement is 56 degrees, which is obviously structural as well. Um, and the sagittal plane, um, uh, neither of those criteria meet structurality, but since the coronal plane criteria meets structurality, this is a, a major thoracic curve with a structural minor proximal thoracic curve above and a structural minor lumbar curve below. So it's a triple major curve type four, it's the same as the AIS system. Now for the lumbosacral mitre fryer, we also use the supine image uh, of, to define whether the lumbosacral fractional curve is structural or non-structural. Uh, you see um, on the far left is a supine image where the L4 to sacrum, and that's how we measure lumbosacral um, uh, structural curves from L4 to sacrum, is eight degrees. So that's less than 20 degrees, so that's non-structural. And on the far right is the supine image with the residual L4 to sacrum curve of 24 degrees, which is structural. So our cutoff here is 20 degrees. Uh, we got the, uh, you may ask, how do we come up with these 35 degree criteria for the minor curves and the proximal thoracic and lumbar region and the 20 degree criteria for the lumbosacral region? Basically, that was through a review of hundreds of x-rays that James Lynn did uh, in determining basically when myself and my partners uh, uh, treated these curves uh, or not. Uh, so it's not perfect, but I can tell you it's, it's a good guide to look at. So if something uh, uh, you know, is um, measures 21 degrees uh, residuals uh, L4 to sacrum curve uh, on the AP supine image. That's obviously a structural curve, but you got to look at it in context of everything else. So just because it's structural doesn't absolutely indicate that you have to treat that curve, but again, it strongly recommends that you do. And obviously the larger the curve is greater than 20 degrees, the more likely you are to include that in the fusion. And the uh, farther it is away from 20 degrees, uh, being uh, less than 20 degrees, the less likely you are to include it. So, you know, 20 degrees is, is a cutoff to make it reliable, but it's obviously you have to take everything in context. And for the third component, the second modifier is a global balance modifier. Again, uh, the cutoff here being four centimeters of coronal or sagittal balance from C7 to the, to the, to the sacrum. So you see the far left, uh, the patient is balanced in the coronal and sagittal plane. So that will be a, a BAL or balanced. Uh, modifier. Um, uh, the next uh, uh, x-ray is a patient with plus, plus seven centimeters of sagittal balance, seven to sacrum, so that's a SAG modifier. Uh, next patient is five centimeters in a coronal plane imbalance, so that's a coronal balance modifier. And then if you have combined sagittal and coronal imbalance, you're a COM or combined modifier. So there's four choices here, a balanced, sagittal imbalanced, coronal imbalanced, or combined imbalanced. Uh, again, these are applied to the uh, uh, upright um, uh, AP and lateral x-rays. So putting this all together, here's a, a, a patient. We see the uh, upright AP on the left, the supine in the middle, upright lateral on the right. Again, the thoracal lumbar curve is uh, 48 degrees. That's the major curve. You see in the supine image that the proximal thoracic and um, uh, um, curve is, um, and main thoracic curve are non-structural. They're less than 35 degrees. But the uh, lumbosacral curve is 22 degrees, which makes it structural in the, um, uh, for the lumbosacral modifier. And the sagittal plane is otherwise uh, unremarkable. And the, and the balance is good for both uh, AP and sagittal planes. So this is a 5S or structural balanced curve classification. So James Lynn and I uh, uh, had the base, our fellows and other attending surgeons, 12 surgeons uh, in entirety grade, 30 pre-marked x-rays uh, twice, one week apart, again, looking for reliability. 
um, um, uh, measurements here. And uh, you see for both curve type, lumbar circle modifier, and global balance modifier, the kappa values were pretty good. A um, little uh, less for the curve type, but uh, excellent for the lumbar circle modifier and global balance modifier. And this is part of a um, uh, uh, submission we had of the spine deformity, which hopefully will get accepted any day now. We've had two or three revisions and we're very, very close to getting accepted. This uh, James will be first author for this new system, again, with the reliability data. So here overall, again, is the intra-rater reliability. The previous was intra-rater. This is intra-rater. It was a little bit better. Surgeons uh, giving the same answer twice over the, over the course of the week time period for the, for the x-rays reviewed. So again, the new system, uh, classification system ADIS has three components, a curve type, one through six, a lumbosacral modifier, the non-structural or structural, and a global, global balance modifier, they're balanced, sagittally imbalanced, coronally imbalanced, or combined imbalanced to give a complete curve classification uh, of this triad system. So yeah, I'll stop here now and ask uh, maybe Wendy uh, uh, Gibbs, a radiologist, for her thoughts on, uh, on this radiographic uh, system. Wendy, your oh thoughts on this? <laughs> the, probably the worst person you can ask in the panel, but so it's interesting because of all parts of spine, this is the one part that at least neuroradiologists don't really know and we don't report. And I've been told, I've asked so many people, why don't we put some of these measurements in? Usually put in a cob, I put in like sagittal and coronal balance. And I'm told that it's because you measure, you all measure them and we don't want there to be a discrepancy right. or it's a waste of time or something like that. So I was so interested in hearing your talk about this because if there is something we can provide in our reports that's useful to you, then I would love to be able to tell my colleagues that we should do that. Or if the answer is no, leave it alone, leave it up to you, then that's my answer too. So I'll, I'll kind of turn that back to you. Yeah, I think I mean, ultimately when it'd be ideal, obviously, if we had... Um... Uh, you know, uh, automatic measurements of these, right? Uh, that were, there's no discrepancy that these are all automated. So if the measurements are automated, then obviously you can design software to, to shoot out the classification system. So the reliability would be perfect, right? Based on the measurements that are provided. So that's where we're headed, obviously. Uh, you know, we probably should be there now, honestly, <laughs> in 2020, we're not yet, but uh, that, you know, that's sort of be the goal. That's my goal in the, in the very near future to get everything automated. So, uh, you know, uh, at least the classifications perspective uh, we can um, uh, have that automated. And, and then obviously we have to decide from that, you know, what the treatment will be. Uh, we'll spend more time on deciding what the treatment is instead of doing all the measurements and spending time on the measurements and the classification. Can I, wait, can I say one thing on that real fast, Griffin? Yeah, please. We have seen one of the very few machine learning papers that I've seen, which has been, you know, a little bit successful for spine was on this kind of measurement for spine. There are very few things where I think there's any kind of progress in machine learning, but this was one. So is that something, Dr. Link, that you're working on? Yes, we are, yes. That's, your, your lab is working on that. Too bad, in, and I know uh, Jonathan Rizzoli knows a lot about that too, and John Shin, who's not here. We know right. you need good um, labels for that though, and that's something I'm very interested right. in, radiology. You have to have accurate labels to, to feed into your machine learning algorithms to right. build them accurately. Um, that's right. Anyway, that's my last, my last comment on that. Thanks. Griffin, go ahead. Maybe I'll ask, uh, Actually, I was going to ask maybe Koi, since Griffin's has seen this before. So, Koi, uh, I don't know if you've seen this before. Your, your initial thoughts, if you haven't, I don't know, I'm sure if you're familiar with this at all. It's, uh, it's not published, obviously, and it's been presented at one or two meetings. But uh, any thoughts on this, Koi? Hey, Dr. Link, I think it's uh, going to be uh, really useful. I did uh, have a couple of questions for you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the uh, use of supine films rather than the standing films that are focused on by folks uh, who study, I guess, um, sagittal deformity? And also, can you talk about um, the evolution from um, uh, uh, side bending films to supine films as well? Sure. So, um, uh, honestly, um, almost my entire career I've gotten as part of a pre op imaging package, a supine AP image. And honestly, I must give um, credit to Keith Bridwell, my mentor back in St. Louis, who kind of got me hooked on that back in the 1990s. And the reason for it was, was several fold. Number one is that uh, just taking gravity off the spine um, and laying the patient down obviously diminishes the curves in the coronal plane. Uh, and you know, it's much more uh, uh, um, imitating what you'll find being prone in the OR. Uh, so uh, that's very helpful to kind of plan things based on 
on that x-ray than this the upright x-ray because that's what the patient's gonna look like after you expose the, the patient more closely to that. Interestingly also, and especially in some adults, uh, the, um, the vertebra uh, and pedicles, everything's a little sharper since there's no movement. Obviously it's a little different now that we have, uh, we have EOS at our center, so the, the images are quite clear, but if your images are uh, uh, you know, touch blurry, if there's any movement to the patients, you know, especially heavy patients, and often you just can't see radiographic landmarks just clear, right? Pedicle shadows and pars and things like that. Where you lay someone down, they're not moving, you see those much clearer. Uh, so I've always liked that aspect too, and especially when we're learning how to do, you know, put screws in these vertebrae 20, 20 years ago freehand, you know, we, we really needed to see the radiographic anatomy better. Uh, and also the thing I like is, uh, you know, getting a supine image uh, is gonna give the same reliability of that type of measurement though, uh, anywhere in the world. You know, when you start pushing, pulling, side bending, there's too much subjectivity that's introduced into that um, um, uh, system of flexibility assessment. So this is universal, you know, the same uh, 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 patient, uh, whether they lay, uh, get a supine x-ray in New York or Hong Kong or, or um, Paris, it doesn't matter. They're gonna have the same, you know, uh, uh, they should have the same measurements, right? Um, and it's not, there's no, one, there's no um, uh, subjective nature to the patient or the, technician that needs to do anything to, you know, to, to make a, uh, this image. Now, obviously, it's not going to be an optimal correction of the deformity, right? You know, we can have things like side menders or push prones or traction films that will give optimal correction, but this is consistent correction, and I like the consistency of it, that we can compare apples to apples. So, you know, if I have a 75-degree curve that has a supine image go to 50 degrees and and someone has a 75 degree curve that the supine image goes to 35 degrees, they got a much more flexible curve than I do, right? If it goes to 50 and it's the same, then that's, that's the same curve. That's the same amount of, of curve. And so we can, can start comparing apples to apples where you start comparing side benders, it's much harder to do that. And, and also side benders, you know, it takes you out of the coronal plane. And so, uh, you know, balance is so key, especially in any patient, especially adults, as I mentioned, you know, everything stays balanced when you look at the supine image. So it's kind of the, some of the rationale why I really like the supine image. Uh, Griffin, you had exposure to that in, Columbia, what did you think uh, about using supine images for evaluation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that's been, uh, as I've started my practice, one of the best things uh, that I've been able to bring over here to Lenox Hill, especially with a lot of the spine surgeons that I've been working with. Um, really, uh, number one, I think it's so intuitive. That that's what the spine looks like when you've got them on the table. And so in a lot of ways, it makes perfect sense that you're going to analyze what you need to do in the operating room based on what, how they're going to look in, you know, on the, the supine film. You know, the other thing too, obviously the, the radiographic conventions that you worked on a long time ago where, you know, flipping the film. So the left is on the left-hand side, making the, the pictures look as if uh, the patient was lying in the operating room. I think that really allows for standardization of, you know, having a discussion of what you would do from a surgical approach. What's interesting to me, and, and I don't know if any of the others want to comment, but it seems like there's a tremendous learning curve, especially if your center is not doing supine x-rays or trying to get a, a cross table 36 inch uh, uh, is nearly a, an impossible task. And, uh, you know, and then obviously uh, uh, having uh, EOS really, it makes it a lot easier, but um, even just the standing 36 inch scoliosis x-rays, if you're not in a center where you're doing a lot of spinal deformity, it can, uh, it can be a little bit complicated. So um, that's a long answer to your short question. Sure. All right. Anyone have any comments? Otherwise, we can go to some cases to highlight this system and talk about treatment. Yeah, let's start. So, let's do some cases. That's great. All right. All right. Let me go to the. the, the I need to see. Uh, I need to get off my fix full screen, so I need to go to my cases here. And uh, there on that. This. Uh, do I need to share screen again, or am I good? Uh, yeah, you got to share one more time. Yeah, okay. Let me do that again. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. You want me to share mine while he's uh, yeah, I'm trying to see. Yeah, I think I got I'm trying to find where's the there's so much on my screen here. Let's see, let's see that. Uh, 
Can't find my share screen now. Where is it at here? Okay, well, he's looking, then I'm going to ask questions of the panel. Is right. that okay? Bring it. Jonathan, Ali. Because I don't think Dr. Linke answered my question <laughs> about whether you would want radiologists to report these things or not. What happens in your practices and what would you prefer? And be honest. Because I don't I think I'm a radiologist here today, so you won't hurt by me. For me, the answer is yes. Any help I can get from the radiologist, that would be great. What if it's different than what you measure? What happens if you get a different answer? I mean, I'm sure it's going to be similar, but what do you do then? Yeah, Wendy, that's a great question. And, and we talked about this. Uh, it came up if, uh, maybe last month. As long as the radiologist uh, measures the angle or let's say the coronal angle, the Cobb angle, or the sagittal balance, as long as they indicate which uh, vertebra they used, uh, two vertebra they used, then it shouldn't be a problem. I may, I may measure from a different vertebra, but that's okay. So I think uh, it would be helpful if they, if certainly the radiologist, you know, mentioned angle, but specifically states uh, which vertebra they used. Uh, I think that would be really helpful. Okay, which which measures would you want? You want Cobb? You want coronal balance, sagittal balance? What else? Or not those? Yeah, I mean, let's see what other people think, but I think the common ones, you know, depends if we're talking about children or adults, but certainly the uh, the coronal Cobb angle, the sagittal balance, lumbar lordosis, and then the sacral pelvic parameters, which wow. is the incidence, pelvic tilt, and... Uh, Nobody does that. So <laughs> if, Nobody that's does. the thing with us. If you're going to give us something, we're going to want more. Uh, but, but I think the basic, uh, uh, let's say adult, for example, the basic adult deformity parameters, probably about you know, uh, half a dozen or so uh, of them, that would be really key. I don't, do you think you know your field very well? Do you think you can get uh, radiologists to be able to, to, to do that? What's, what do you think the pushback? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to make a talk, you know, with my structured reporting talks, which people like, and I'm going to do it with Dr. Lakey's system, and I'm going to convince everybody they need to do this. That's my mission. It'll take, it'll take a little while, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> That's why I want to know which ones. Which ones are the most important? If I can only get them to do three or four, I need to know which three or four to do. Griffin, you're unmuted. What do you think? Or I can't, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Who, me? I'm talking. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, no, I agree. I agree with Ali. I think maximum Cobb and, and indicating where you're measuring it from. Spinal pelvic parameters, lumbar lordosis would be great. Um, I think that would be a, a, a huge help and allow for some standardization and uh, probably uh, decision making. Got my screen now, Griffin. You guys got my yeah, screen. Yeah, you're all you're all yeah, set. But, well, maybe let's right. talk about some cases, and we'll uh, we'll come yeah. back to this, Wendy. That sounds great. All right. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Da, 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 make sure. Okay. All right. All right. First case here is a 27 year old male who presents with this uh, large curve. I'm sorry. This is actually the first case here. Um, so it's a 44 year old female uh, has some lumbar pain. Presents with these X-rays. Upright, as you can see, and these are supine. So um, uh, the difference from the AP supine. So the question is, what is the uh, ADIS classification here? So again, her major curve is the 52 degree local lumbar curve. And, uh, one, you know, the major curve in, in this system. Once you have the major curve, this is an operative system. So we're going to operate on that curve. So it's really irrelevant what that bends out to or supines out to. So it's 41, but even if it was 34, it wouldn't matter because that's still the curve. That's the major curve. So the Minor criteria we apply are the, the minor curves above and below uh, the, the non-major curves. So the 35 degree thoracic curve, supines of 27 degrees, uh, and the L4 to sacrum lumbosacral fractional curve is 12 degrees on supine imaging. So um, I'll, maybe I'll take this first one. So uh, so basically uh, uh, the thoracic lumbar curve is major, which is type five. The thoracic curve above is non-structural. The uh, lumbosacral curve below at 12 degrees is non-structural and the patient has uh, good coronal and sagittal balance. So the overall classification is five NS balance. Okay, so obviously the, you know, the treatment recommendations are very similar to the AIS system is that we're recommending treat, treating only the structural curves and not treating the non-structural curves. So for a five NS balance, uh, it would recommend that we only treat the thoracolumbar lumbar curve, that we don't uh, extend down to the sacrum and pelvis because then the lumbosacral curve is non-structural, and we don't treat the thoracic curve because that's non-structural as well. So that's what you—that's um, what the 
classification system is recommending. So Ali Baj, what, what do you think about that? And it's 44 year old uh, that has this curve pattern and complaints of kind of mid lumbar back pain. What are your thoughts about uh, uh, treating this patient? Uh, um, both kind of regionally uh, uh, as well as uh, specific um, uh, uh, UIV, LIV and, and techniques to do that. Uh, sure. Thank you, Dr. Lenke. You know, this is a great case, and I, and I think this is, uh, alludes back to what you were saying initially. If it was a pediatric patient, it'd be so different. But since this is adult, I think for me, and, you know, perhaps more as a neurosurgeon, this is where the MRI is really critical. Right, right. Because although on the supine films, uh, the lumbosacral or, let's say, fractional curve is 12, but I want to see what the 4, 5, and 5, 1 disc look like, because I think that would affect whether... Um, I extend down to uh, the sacrum and the pelvis or not. Um, so, you know, I think by this classification system, if you, you know, you don't have to treat the, the lower, the lumbosacral curve, but depending on how degenerate um, the four, five, and five, one discs are, obviously you'll have a conversation with the patient, but I, I may include that uh, depending on how degenerated it is. So, you know, thoracic to pelvic or uh, perhaps shorter, you know, L2, uh, L1 or L2 to say L4, it, but again, it just depends on what the fractional curve looks like radiographically, but also on the MRI. Right, as I said, yeah, that's one. You know, those are my thoughts. Yeah, no, you're 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 spot on there. And honestly, to give, I'll uh, I'll give another shout out to James Lynn. James Lynn really pushed me to have the MRI as part of the system, but I rejected initially because I felt that if we added the MRI initially, it'd be too complex. And, uh, and, pe and wouldn't pe people wouldn't catch on as quickly. So I, you know, we kept it radiographic now, but obviously you, you, you have to look at an MRI before you decide treatment on all these patients, especially when they have lumbar curves. So I completely agree with you. So, uh, but again, what we need to do is, uh, and in, in my experience is patients who have, you know, f far less than a 20 degree residual curve, usually that patient, uh, especially if they have good sagittal alignment to the lumbar spine, the discs aren't too degenerated and if they're not too old. But again, that's, you know, that's obviously there's a spectrum there, as you know. So, um, uh, uh, but again, uh, you, you do need a, and, and obviously I would never treat this patient uh, uh, without looking at the MRI of the L4 to sacrum region, right, to, to, to ensure that we could do this and take away her pain and, and have a good result for this. But um, so you bring up very good points. But not to belabor it, I, I end up just treating the thoracolumbar curve, uh, just like I would do in an adolescent. This I did a based on adolescent treatment of a T11 to L3 uh, short stomach fusion. You see a horizontalized L3, all four to sacrum. You see horizontalized nice, uh, corrected nicely with this, and and she did well with this uh, treatment early on. So uh, kept her balanced, and again just did a short short fusion and took away her pain because her pain was coming from her. You see, there's a subluxation of L2 and L3. You see on the coronal upright X-ray. So um, uh, uh, that's where I felt a lot of her pain was coming from. But again, your, your point's well taken. You have to examine the disc below this fusion, L3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1, to be able to, to get away with this in a, in a middle age or older adult. Any other comments from anybody else? Well, you know, Dr. Lenke, this is a, a great example. Obviously, uh, th these were some of the best days uh, last year during fellowship. Uh, th these cases were the most fun. It was like the smallest case we ever did. So uh, it's my arth arthroscopy of the knee case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Ollie's point is really well taken, you know, especially for, for neurosurgeons like us. You know, we get so used to seeing the MRI first and not the x-rays. And so sort of you know, getting, and especially for degenerative cases, getting surgeons to get x-rays sometimes can be a real challenge. And this is where I think if you have any experience um, seeing pediatric patients with AIS, this sort of workflow starts to make a lot more sense and you're able to kind of evaluate it. And, you know, I think once you've seen enough of these patients throughout the spectrum of spinal disease from AIS to ADIS to then when it becomes degenerative disease, you can see how, you know, maybe this patient would do well, but you know, who knows, maybe 20 years down the line, they start to degenerate L4-5 and L5-S1. And then, you know, then it becomes, a, you know, more of a degenerative case. Um, we did have a question a little bit earlier about um, whether or not you are advocating using this for degenerative scoliosis cases, or if this, they should be treated uh, very differently in the classification. Yeah, this is specifically for ADIS, Griffin. So that, and that's why, you know, I think for degenerative scoliosis, you really would need to have an MRI as part of the classification system. Yeah. Uh, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, but I, I guess, you know, in some degenerative cases, you, you could theoretically use this system, um, at least to organize your thoughts. But, uh, you know, in those patients, the MRI is much more critical for, for evaluation and treatment recommendations. And, and I'll show an example of that later on 
uh, the ADIS case, but has more degenerative implications because they have stenosis at the bottom of their curve, and that you know one of their main complaints was leg pain. So uh, obviously, you know, it's uh, uh, it's a it's a complicated issue. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So here's um, second case. Uh, uh, again, uh, 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 I think this is a 28-year-old uh, adult. Um, has this obvious, a large, very large thoracic scoliosis. See the upright X-ray on the far left, the supine in the middle, and the sagittal on the right. Uh, you see the uh, supine proximal thoracic curve is 40 degrees, and the lumbosacral curve is uh, 16 degrees. So uh, again, I'll give the classification here as two MS balanced. And so um, uh, again, a second case that's kind of treated just like AIS. I, mean, I, I highlighted these two first cases because they really are, um, and there's a spectrum of you know, young and middle-aged uh, adults that we evaluate and treat very similar to older adolescents, right? Uh, uh, you know, we draw the center sacral vertical line here. You know, we look at what the last touched vertebra is. Uh, you know, we uh, try and uh, maintain optimal shoulder balance by seeing how a structural the proximal thoracic curve is. So you, know, you can really treat this patient, in my mind, similar to if she was 18 years older you know, 27 years old or 47 years old. I mean, you may probably treat them very, very similarly. So um, with that, uh, maybe I'll, Griffin, I'll ask your thought on this. Uh, I think again, 27 year old male, a um, so little bit of uh, uh, shortness of breath, PFT is around 40% of normal. And um, uh, what are your thoughts about treatment of this, uh, this patient? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, like you said, that looking at the last touch vertebrae, um, probably looking at five, four, three. Cats, there's just a little bit of, of two on the um, the standing films. Um, so, you know, I think uh, this is going to take uh, really a significant amount of correction. So I would say, you know, UIV probably uh, looking at T2 and LIV maybe L2. Um, you know, I think uh, for a 132 degree curve, you know, you're not really getting much correction, especially with uh, 86 degrees of kyphosis, I think uh, probably this is going to be a, a VCR case uh, at the apex, no question. And then, um, you know, like, uh, like we've discussed many times, uh, you know, at least uh, four rods across that three column osteotomy and um, you know, maybe a preoperative traction might be helpful as well. I don't know if that's something you considered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on, uh, again, I based it on, uh, again, the PFTs and nutritional status, uh, uh, other things, what the, how the uh, MRI looks, what the um, spinal cord shape is at the apex of the curve, uh, so a variety of things. Um, uh, I don't think I did traction on him, but uh, this is what I did. I did do a single level VCR at the apex T9, as you can see here. Uh, so here's his uh, T2. I think actually I went to L3. It looks like from the bottom, uh, 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 L3 was the touch vertebra Griffin. So I, I think um, kind of hard to see what the 12th rib is, but from the bottom, L3 is the last touch vertebra. That's where I stopped. But uh, here's, uh, again, I put three rods. So he was a pretty thin uh, young man, so I only used three instead of four rods on him. But um, I think there's one year post-op x-rays. So you see we have some of the kyphosis corrected. Uh, you know, obviously, you look at the spine uh, here. Um, but uh, in this patient, I'm looking at the rib cage. If you look at the space available for the lung on the concave and convex side, I think we did a pretty nice job of restoring better lung height. And actually, his PFTs at one year post-op were over 60% of normal already. So um, that, to me, is one of the goals here is not only obviously get him radiographically corrected, stop the progression, but also to optimize his pulmonary, cardiopulmonary function when you have these kind of what I call spine and chest wall deformities when the apex is touching the, the rib cage uh, laterally. And then also his postoperative photo. So there's no thoracoplasty here. This is all just spine correction with a single level VCR. So one of your photos. Lance, can you talk about um, how you go about selecting the UIV? Sure. Uh, again, so this is a structural proximal thoracic curve and and any, any patient has a structural proximal thoracic curve and such a large main thoracic curve, I'm going to go to T1 or T2. Uh, you know, I try and avoid T1, just avoid the uh, potential, you know, instability between C7 T1. So here you see I'm going to T2, which is pretty common uh, for any very large, you know, any thoracic curve over 90 or 100 degrees, no matter what the proximal thoracic curve measures, you, you know, you're, you're going to have a risk of elevating the left shoulder if you don't uh, control that by controlling the proximal thoracic curve. So, um, uh, so T2 is pretty, pretty typical. The only time I would go to T1 if there's kyphosis that goes all the way to the cervical thoracic junction, I want to avoid a PJK, then I'll go to uh, T1 and sometimes even C7. You know, I'll go to even C7 if I need to, if there's kyphosis all the way to C7 on the uh, upright x-rays. But I think uh, it looks like his shoulders are pretty good. You know, maybe the I mean, critical on the post-op uh, 
uh, posterior view, maybe his left shoulders are just a touch high. You know, it's hard to keep the shoulders balanced when you do that much main thoracic correction. But um, overall, I think his trunk alignment is uh, is pretty pretty acceptable. All right. So third case so again, another younger adults or some older ones common. This is a 28 year old uh, with uh, these upright curves, 60 degree thoracic, 80 degree lumbar, 18 degree lumbar sacral, and she she has a 46 degree thoracic lumbar kyphosis between the two curves um, uh, uh, on, the, on the sagittal plane. In supine image, you see the thoracic curve supines only to 57 degrees. So that's gonna be structural by a criteria. And the L4 to sacrum curve uh, is 12 degrees, which again is non-structural for the lumbar sacral modifier. Uh, patients balanced in both planes. So again, the classification is six non-structural balance. Type six, because again, the major curve is the lumbar curve, but the minor thoracic curve is structural. So just like the AIS system, uh, that's a type six curve. Uh, again, type six curves uh, usually suggests that we treat both the thoracic and lumbar curves with our patient infusion. And because the lumbar sacral curve here in this 28 year old is non-structural and she's balanced, you know, the goal would be to try and avoid um, infusing this to the sacrum and pelvis. So, um, uh, Jonathan, you want to take this one? What your thoughts are on treatment? I think he he may have, he said he'll be right back. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Well, anyone else? You're gonna have to save a good. You're gonna have to save a good case for him. Uh, but but, but I, I if I can chime in here, may I try? Please. This is a, again. This is I think this is a, like a really interesting case because I think you're you're building the case for not involving their sacral pelvic area because of the classification. Yet in adults, this kind of goes against the classic teaching where if you have a long construct, uh, long construct, you don't want to leave a long lever arm without uh, sacro-pelvic fixation. So I, I think this one is a, this one is going to be this one is a is a tough thing because you have to I guess you have to include both curves. So whether it's T3 or T4 down to down to L3, but isn't that a long lever arm uh, uh, against the lower the distal uh, segments? Sure, but uh, you know we uh, we do fusions on L3 or L4 uh, all the time in in, in 18 year olds, and so she this is a 28 year old. So again, obviously acknowledging that her L4 to sacrum discs have to be uh, reasonable on on MRI, and and um, uh, and she lacks obviously lumbar sacral back pain. Um, you know what's the, ten, what's the difference in ten more years? Obviously, as you get older, you know 38 to 48 to 58, it gets much harder. Obviously to to spare the lumbar sacral curve, even if it's quote non-structural on the radiographic criteria. But the point being, I think uh, uh, you know uh, the 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 goal. Of this is, as was the goal of the AIS system is to try and minimize fusion if you can. Obviously, you know we can always go back and fuse things later. You remember, we never cure anybody with spine deformity by doing one operation. If they live long enough, they're going to degenerate above or below and probably need more surgery. But the key is to keep their spine as mobile as possible. Uh, you know, for function, if we can, obviously, as long as you're taking away all their pain generators and, and uh, keeping them keeping them balanced. So that's kind of why this system, just like the AIS system, you know, promotes, uh, uh, um, you know, not fused in the lumbar sacral region if you really don't need to and doing even selective fusions, as you saw the previous case where I did a selective lumbar fusion on a 44-year-old um, uh, to keep the, the spine balanced and keep the spine otherwise mobile. Um, uh, you know, because again, you can always do a longer fusion if you need to, but once you do a fusion, you know, you're set, you're, you're not going to undo that fusion. So that's kind of the, the philosophy, right, right or wrong. Okay. So not belaboring. So, um, uh, you know, 3-4 actually had a bit of a subluxation and 3-4 disc was a little bit uh, uh, degenerated. So that's why I decided to go to L4 here. And here she is two years post-op. Um, see, we got obviously very nice correction of her coronal plane. Uh, as well as the um, thoracic lumbar kyphosis with a cantilever maneuver. We'd obviously the posture column osteotomies of the, uh, the thoracic lumbar region to be able to mobilize that curve and, and correct it uh, nearly fully in the coronal plane and quite well in the sagittal plane as well. And uh, so again, not long-term follow-up, but two years follow-up, she's doing, uh, doing very well and with obvious clinical improvement as well from the, the formula correction. Dr. Lenke, could you um, give us uh, your thoughts on how you decide what levels to do a, a posterior column osteotomy on uh, in the ADIS population? Because I know, you know there's quite a few uh, you know, pediatric uh, surgeons who do IS where the curve is flexible, they may not do osteotomies. They may just you know, correct with uh, screws and, and some uh, derotation maneuvers. So how, how do you go about selecting your levels for osteotomies? Sure, for someone like this, um, you know, with uh, a large thoracic lumbar curve that has kyphosis to it as well, 
in the sagittal plane. You know, I'm going to basically do almost all the open discs. So if you look at the, um, the x-ray from T10 to L3, all those discs on the convexity are open. Uh, so as you see, I did T10 to L3 PCOs. Um, uh, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here, but, uh, uh, you know, obviously my goal in this uh, patient is to get as much correction as possible as I safely can. And, and um, you know, that, that's the carpentry of the spine, if you can do these safely safely efficiently with uh, minimal neurologic risk and not much blood loss. I mean, I, I'm, I do a fair amount, as you know, Griffin of PCOs, and I think it just adds, uh, it makes it a little easier for, to, for correction because you've done a little more carpentry and uh, you can see the result here, how, how that works. So uh, usually, again, just looking at the, the discs that are open on the convexity of the major curves, those are the, the main areas I look at for doing PCOs, and at least in the coronal plane. And obviously, it's nice in the sagittal plane if you have pathology as well, that over the same areas, you're gonna help correct the sagittal pathology in the same manner as the coronal plane. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, so here's uh, a little trick here. So now it's the 52-year-old, and again, this patient presents with low, low back pain and significant left leg pain. That's actually, I think his left leg pain actually was even uh, a bigger part of his symptom complex than his low back pain. So here's his upright film. So you see 32 degrees, 47 degrees, and 18 degrees from L4 to sacrum. And you see the sagittal measurements on the right. A little bit of PI, 16 degree PI, all mismatch, but again, his overall sagittal global uh, balance is not too bad. So here's a supine image, uh, 22 degrees thoracic, uh, 20 degrees lumbar, and then 14 degrees for the lumbosacral region. So that's non-structural. Uh, thoracic curve obviously is non-structural and his balance is good. So the classification is uh, five NS balanced. Um, so the question is, you know, what uh, is this, you know, that's suggesting as in the previous five NS balanced case that we just do the, the lumbar curve and leave the lumbosacral fractional curve alone. Uh, but again, I'm going to cheat here and I'm going to say, you know, this is a case, as all cases, that we really need the MRI. So, you know, there's no way that we can not, uh, you know, decompress his stenosis. That's obviously a three, four, and four, five uh, causing his left leg pain um, and not include that in the fusion here. So this is where, again, uh, you know, the, the, there's, a, uh, there's a break in the classification system that we, you know, we can't always treat patients exactly like the 2D radiographic system. Uh, 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 recommends, right? Um, we're going to have to consider uh, doing additional surgery on this patient to relieve the, uh, the symptom complex. So given that, in fact, um, Griffin, what are your thoughts on this patient for treatment? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, this is very interesting because in a lot of ways, this is sort of two cases in one. Uh, you know, even though, uh, you know, as, as the patient lives long enough, you know, their two disease process sort of intersect. But um, you know, I think that uh, I would be very hard pressed not to include the, the lower level. So um, I'm looking at the last touched. Uh, let's see, five, four, three, two, one, twelve, eleven. Looks like ten. Um, so you know, I think uh, uh, given the left leg symptoms, given some um, kyphosis across the thoracolumbar junction, I think this is probably a T10 to the pelvis for me, uh, with uh, some uh, T lifts at the bottom, probably four, five, and and five, one. Okay. Well, you're trained pretty well there, Griffin. T10 to sacrum. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, it's a two level T lifts, you say, uh, you know, obviously with adequate decompression of three, four, four, five, and uh, S2AI screws, and obviously a lot of care around the uh, T10 level, you know, to avoid PJK, which is why uh, we're going to fight here long term in this patient, right? Who's already has cervical disease treated operatively. Um, so here's early film. I think I have longer. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I had I had his uh, two-year upright EOS films. He's still doing very well. He has, does not develop PJK. And um, you see how I bent uh, some kyphosis in the top of the rods there uh, from T10 to uh, T12 to stress relieve that area, not try and pull T10 back too much. Um, uh, I normally don't use tethers, as, as Griffin knows. Uh, I'm not opposed to using tethers to... Uh, to grab another level or two above my UIV, but I'm not a huge fan of that for various reasons. I try and optimize, minimize dissection. Actually, this patient, I did a Hamza technique, Griffin. I don't know if we ever did that together. Did we ever do a Hamza together? Yeah, we did several. Yeah, so I, I, this is a, Hamza stands for hybrid open muscle sparing approach. You know, I, 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 uh, I'm kind of old fashioned. I don't use navigation or robotics or anything. I, but what I do on these kind of patients, I'll uh, open them up uh, normally from L1 to sacrum, from T10 to L1. I go paraspinal, so I keep the midline fascia intact. I go between the longissimus and multifidus muscles and get exposure of the facet joint 
pars above and below, and, uh, and I do freehand screws to that interval, and I decorticate and fuse to that interval as well. And uh, I don't what your thoughts on that approach that you've seen a couple times, Griffin. What do you think? Is that uh, malarkey, or you think it's uh, helpful? No, I, I absolutely think it's helpful. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, how you treat the soft tissue envelope at the, the top of, of your construct is really makes all the difference in the world. And, um, you know, if you, uh, if you start to take things apart or you get a little bit overzealous or maybe the fellow gets overzealous and starts getting to a facet joint or, you know, there's any number of things that could happen that maybe, you know, there's no record of, uh, you know, either in the operative report or in the initial post-op x-rays. But, you know, when you start judging your outcomes at two years, five years, 10 years, I think that's the kind of stuff that makes a big difference. So no, no question, I think it, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. And uh, I definitely uh, uh, try and do that, especially for my longer cases. The other thing I was gonna mention uh, too is I had teased to Koi and some of the other uh, uh, viewers a couple weeks ago about our uh, posterior skull to the upper instrumentation line. Uh, I know uh, we had that accepted at SRS, right. which is gonna be a right. meeting this year, but uh, we were having a discussion about PJK and so, you know, it's always uh, interesting when you discuss doing these long segment constructs uh, and, you know, where you try and stop. And, you know, obviously pretty much any construct that's going to end near the uh, maximum kyphosis of the, the thoracic spine is going to be posterior to the skull. So huge risk of PJK. Um, so really, I think that's uh, part of why we try and stop either at T10 or we go up to T4 is uh, right. get this in that ballpark. Exactly. Hey, Dr. Lenke, I haven't seen a lot of your films where you use um, uh, inner bodies. Can you talk about uh, your choice of uh, doing some T-lifts for this case? Yeah, so uh, uh, basically uh, every patient I treat uh, with a thoracic to sacrum fusion, I pretty much do inner body at a minimum 5-1. I did 4-5 here just because we did such an extensive decompression for the stenosis. And in longer constructs now, I'm often doing 3-4 as well just because I've had a few patients that pseudo that, you know, they heal four, five, five, one, and it'll pseudo three, four. Um, but uh, at a minimum, I almost always do five, one, and uh, I'll do four, five based on if I need it for correction, if I need it for fusion, especially if I do a wide decompression posteriorly, which I did on this patient. So, but I'm a TILA person. I used to do a list back in the 1990s. Since 2000, I've done everything from the back. I've not done any anterior surgery for any deformity since 2000. Uh, whereas in the 1990s, half my cases were anterior posteriors or anterior alone. So, um, I definitely know how to go anterior, but I've stopped them um, over 20 years ago now. Uh, do everything from the back. Griffin will test. All right, so a little more difficult uh, case here. 69 year old now, trunkal imbalance, collapse, rib on pelvis deformity, uh, some stenosis on the right side. Uh, again, uh, obviously left is left, right is right on the coronal x ray. So here's our upright x rays, and then here's our supine image in the middle. So again, uh, thoracic curve, uh, 41 degrees structural. Uh, obviously, the major curve is 89 degrees. It goes down to 60 degrees uh, on supine, and the lumbosacral curve, L4 to sacrum, is 26 degrees. Um, coronal plane is uh, off 2.2 centimeters, so that's still considered balanced. Sagittal plane is forward 6.2 centimeters, so again, by our criteria, that's, that's sagittally imbalanced. So the classification would be type 6, since the major curve is a lumbar curve, and the thoracic curve is structural, so that's type 6. Uh, the lumbosacral curve is structural, 6S, and then sagittally imbalanced with uh, probably due to the thoracic kyphosis, obviously. So, um, Ali, you want to go through this? What your thoughts are on this, on this patient, the 69-year-old? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's got a little yeah. bit of osteopenia, too. I think she's just short of osteoporosis. She has osteopenia, not osteoporosis, but definitely a little softer bone. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. That, uh, so as long as she... Kind of passes all of the uh, medical clearance and the uh, the DEXA scans and the and the full workup and make sure she's fit for a big surgery because this is not going to be one where you can go short and get an acceptable any kind of acceptable uh, uh, correction. So she's 69, weighing all the risks and benefits, and if she's up to it and she's medically cleared, I think given given your classification system, given that she has structural curves at all three regions. Uh, she probably needs a high thoracic to uh, pelvic fixation, in my opinion, with multiple uh, PCOs for correction. If she has not had prior surgeries, I think PCOs should do the job. Yeah, no prior surgeries, that's correct. Um, and I, thanks for highlighting the medical aspects of this. Obviously, you know, first and foremost, you know, when patients start getting older, we need to 
will weigh you know the the risk benefit ratio for the for the radiographic correction right the radiographic correction is obviously secondary to to their health and their well being obviously so thanks for pointing that out that's that's very so very important because these are going to be big surgeries no matter how you do it whether you do front or back or all posterior how Ali, how would how would you do this would you do this all posterior would you do front and back how would you technically do this surgery if uh, if this patient again is uh, is uh, deemed healthy enough to have uh, an extensive surgery how would you personally do it. Yeah, so we're, uh, you know, we're, I'm personally a big fan of, of uh, uh, the, the uh, front back, so maybe a two-level a lift at 4551, um, and then posterior, um, it, but it depends on how much lumbar lordosis I need. Her LL here is, uh, her lumbar lordosis is what, 20, what's her match? But it's about uh, 30 degrees. It's, she's got a PIL on mismatch. She's definitely a hypolordotic in her lumbar spine, and when we see global kyphosis, it goes almost to L4. Yeah, if, if, if I need to get significant uh, correction at the lumbosacral junction, I really like uh, the ALIF approach. And then that makes, uh, that makes, that, I don't have to rely as much on, on an aggressive PCO posteriorly for these. So, you know, if she's medically fit, I have no problem doing a, say, a 5-1 ALIF with a hyperlordotic graft and then posterior, maybe T4, T3 or T4 down to pelvis. And I would do this in stages. Several stages. Okay, great. I don't have to belabor it. Uh, so I did this all from the back to T2 to sacrum. Went to T2. If you know, if, uh, again, I really like to include in these older patients with osteopenia all the kyphotic segments. You know, so her kyphosis goes all the way to T2. So I'm I'm going to T2, not T3 or T4. And um, uh, C3 level T lifts here. Uh, PCOs across the thoracolumbar junction. Um, uh, so I think we've got our fairly nicely. Balance in the coronal and sagittal plane. And when you're post up, she had uh, thankfully no complications through this. Uh, I think we've got her you know, total body images. And when you're post up, you see her posterior cranial line is sitting uh, backwards uh, posterior to her top of her construct, which is a good sign for uh, avoiding PJK. Uh, not perfect, but something that, again, Griffin's looked at. And we think that helps us. Uh, we just draw a vertical line posterior to the skull and see where it falls in relation to the top of the instrumentation. And ideally, you want the screw heads to be uh, sitting anterior to that line, which it does here. You can envision that line in your, on the post op lateral x ray. And one thing I wanted to highlight here's her photos is that uh, one of your post up here, her true, and I actually had my nurse uh, call her to confirm this because I didn't believe it. Her is a one year post op SRS and ODI scores. So you see her. SRS scores, she has no pain. Uh, she has a five score in her uh, pain score for uh, uh, SRS. Um, uh, and her ODI is zero when you're post-op. My ODI is not zero, uh, I can tell you, ever. So uh, it's kind of amazing you can do these major reconstructions on some people and, and have a very nice result um, from these uh, as far as how they feel about it. So. All right, so how are we doing? We're 553, Griffin. Um, one more case, or how would you? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a visitor here, so what? 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 I think uh, if if we can do one more case, and then uh, definitely want to leave a, a few minutes at the end for Wendy's flipped case, because I think uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, so one yeah, more let's case. do this. So 64 year old male. Now one more case. So 64 year old male presents with this X-ray. These X-rays. Uh, you see um, um, a major 76 degree thoracic lumbar curve, 50 degree thoracic curve. Um, uh, and you see here, one thing is that there's a fair amount of coronal imbalance. So this coronal vertical axis is 7.9 centimeters to the left. But in the sagittal plane, uh, he's well balanced actually. Uh, a little bit of uh, a PIL mismatch, but overall the sagittal plane is uh, reasonably balanced. So here's uh, uh, supine imaging, 36 degree thoracic uh, curve, structural and 27 degree uh, lumbosacral curve. Again, meets our structural criteria as well from L4 to sacrum. And so this is going to classify as six structural coronal now, coronal imbalanced. And um, so again, the question is what to do with this patient. I can tell you that uh, uh, you know, his uh, apex you see, his thoracic lumbar apex is autofuse. Uh, you know, it's 76 degrees upright, it's only 75 degrees supine. And on CT imaging, uh, uh, he's autofuse, his apex, uh, as often males do, you know, with longstanding deformity. Um, and his main complaint is just he's leaning over more and more to the left. That's his main complaint, um, back pain and, and, and progressive imbalance to the left. Um, you know, I complain about the sagittal planes. The sagittal posture is actually pretty reasonable. So um, I guess the question is what, uh, what, uh, what to do on this patient with a rigid thoracolumbar apex. The other thing I can tell you medically is uh, 
Uh, he's got a little bit of heart disease. He, uh, he's got a stent placed in the past, so he's on Plavix, and so he's, you know, he's, he's, being, he's got clearance from his cardiologist and his internist, but he's not exactly the healthiest guy in the world. So, uh, you know, so my thought is, you know, how, what can I do to, to solve his problem, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, stabilize his spine, prevent him from getting worse, you know, obviously correct him if I can, but, you know, not spend 12 hours doing it or two or, or three, two, three sessions doing it because he isn't the healthiest guy and he's on Plavix. So that, that uh, you'll see kind of what I did weighs into that a bit. Um, so anyone want to give their su any suggestion on here? Uh, Corey, you want to give yeah, your thoughts on what you do with this? Uh, Don, yeah, do sure. Uh, you know, like you've mentioned, uh, pretty bad chronal deformity in a sick person here uh, with autofusion across the um, across the apex. I think this might be a good case for a, a T10 to pelvis with an asymmetric PSO um, across the uh, uh, across the apex there. Okay, that's certainly that was actually my uh, one of my thoughts as well. Um, we can run a short of time, so not to labor it. You see this. Auto fusion there, not to belabor it. Actually, I, I didn't do a PCO. I did, I did a thoracic curve, but I did this a kickstand correction of his coronal imbalance. So I left his apex auto fused, and I released him uh, above and below his apex. You see, I did two level T lips below, and I did, I think, a, a few PCOs T10 to L1, and I left his auto fused apex alone uh, to decrease bleeding and just uh, uh, get him balanced using the kickstand additional kickstand screw uh, iliac screw you can see there in a the kickstand rod to kind of jack him up on the left side if you can envision that. So. I didn't do any three column osteotomy um, and did this all in one day and got him balanced without doing any three column osteotomy. So just uh, another thought on how to take care of someone like this without, uh, without doing a three column osteotomy two years post up. All right, another, another option. Certainly an asymmetric PSO is certainly, that, that's actually, if, it, if someone's healthier, that's what I would do, Coy, actually that's, that's exactly what I'd be thinking, but this is an option if someone is uh, less healthy and, and really has a coronal plane problem more than a sagittal plane problem. You know, so you can get away, just distract off his, uh, off his ileum, get away with it. It's a little easier and less blood loss. All right, All right so you want to- uh, The case is, thank case, you. Uh, Griffin? Yeah, Wendy, um, do you, uh, you want to show your, um, your PowerPoint? And Wendy, if you'll unmute yourself. There we go. Perfect. All right, so before somebody starts taking this, I just noticed something here. First picture, which of you in the panel can tell me what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> yeah, Ellie got it. So this is the way it showed up. So this is how the measurements were made. But yeah, so the heart is on the wrong side. So this is not the way you traditionally look at them. Um, and, and, and technically, the SRS, we actually look at the sagittal the other way, too, as you show it. See, at least that's what the scoliosis Research Society has always promoted. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, often uh, the gen surgeons look at the laterals like this, but honestly, the deformity surgeons, at least the, in the SRS, look at them the other way, but that's by, by convention. But there's, there's no right or wrong answer there, but. Yeah. All right. So, well, this, I mean, this is simple. I don't, I'm not the surgeon here, so I don't know too much of the history, except this was a 72-year-old woman with back pain, and I believe she had bilateral leg pain. She had pain everywhere. She had some other um, pain issues. But um, I'm going to let, you know, Griffin, what do you think? Do you want to take this? Do you want Dr. Lanky to take it? Do you want to talk about the measurements on this picture? How do you want to do this? Well, let, uh, let's have it uh, uh, be a true flipped case. Let's see, maybe Dr. Lanky, give us your thoughts on this. I know sure. So let's, let's classify it. It looks like, you know, a true, certainly the thoracic curve is truly idiopathic. Probably what's happened is I think the lumbar curve just degenerated over time, right? There's a subluxation, a rotatory subluxation about four and L5, you can see on the coronal plane. Um, uh, so it, it's really just a longstanding uh, uh, adolescent probably thoracic curve that's uh, probably progressed into adulthood and now with the degenerated lumbar spine. I bet the lumbar spine looked pretty good 20, 30 years ago. And now it's got just degenerative cascading and probably stenosis from your description, Wendy, of the, of the complaints of the patient. I'd be, I, would, I would expect to see stenosis, especially at L4 or 5 because of the significant subluxation of, of uh, anesthesis of L4 and L5 that we can see in the coronal plane. Um, you know, by the classification, the major curve is the thoracic uh, curve, the lumbar curve. Uh, we don't have spine images, but I bet you that's going to be structural to mean greater than 35 degrees. Interestingly here, the lumbar sacral curve is, is, you know, is, is pretty neutral. It's pretty, uh, you know, L4 to sacrum is pretty 
uh, uh, neutral uh, on measurement and the, and, the, and the coronal cop. So it's the pine is going to be the same. So it's going to probably measure non-structural. But again, here's where in a 72 year old with a rotatory subluxation, you know, that's, it's going to be a curve. You're going to have to treat if you're going to treat this patient. Um, uh, so it, that, so that, that's, that we're highlighting the classification isn't perfect, obviously, in, in recommending uh, treatment of the various curves. But, um, uh, you know, this kind of patient, uh, the first thing I would do is, you know, if, uh, honestly, if, if, uh, if their main complaint is, uh, uh, you know, uh, claudication, buttock leg pain, and some low back pain, uh, you know, I'm, uh, there's a thought that, you know, can you just get away with doing some less invasive surgery of the lumbar curve, you know, decompression, maybe limited fusion, one or two level fusion even, and not, not treat the whole thoracic curve. Because again, the thoracic curve, she's had for, for her whole life. And, you know, unless there's documented progression or symptomatology, I don't know if you absolutely need to treat the thoracic curve. Because if you're treating the thoracic curve, then you're doing a you know, a T3, T4, all the way to sacrum procedure on her, which is a big surgery for a, you said 72, Wendy? 72, uh -huh. So, um, so that, this is where you have to listen exactly and, 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 and uh, uh, put the treatment uh, into what exactly bothers the patient. You know, you have to really listen to the patient and, and, uh, 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 and parlay the treatment into uh, what's best for the patient. And there could be several different options here, you know, from uh, an isolated uh, decompression all the way to a, you know, limited decompression, limited or limited decompression with limited fusion all the way to treating the, the entire lumbar curve to treating the entire spine from upper thoracic all the way to sacrum ilium. There's an, every, everything is possible on this patient. So here's where you have to select what's best for the patient based on their needs, their, their health, uh, their wishes, and, and uh, you know, what, uh, what you can get away with, with uh, causing minimal complications. Let me show you one more picture because it'll speak to one of the audience the audience members' questions. Dr. Khan asked about um, bending images. What, what, and I can't see the chat right now. Griffin, what was, what was the exact question about the bending films? Uh, I, I'm not sure, actually. I think it, Are they it, still it, used, maybe? Yeah, I think, uh, how much does uh, side bender radiographs help and do they have, a, have an impact on surgical decision making uh, to differentiate the primary from the secondary curves? And so I have two more, I have a couple more pictures. So I have this, this bending and the other bending for you, if this matters. And so pretty stiff, I, you know, again, in, in the supine image, you're going to see the same thing. It's, they're not going to, the curve, the thoracic curve isn't going to change very much. You know, in the 72 year old longstanding thoracic curve, it's going to be pretty stiff as it's shown here. It's only changing a couple degrees. And now the question is lumbar curve. So the side bending the other way, Wendy, do you have that? How does that change? So, uh, so that changes a bit more, you know, lumbar curve almost always, uh, corrects a bit more because there's no rib cage holding it uh, stiff together. So, um, you know, so 34 degrees on, on side bending means it's going to be greater than 35 degrees supine because there's always less measurement. So in my, in this new classification, it's going to be a structural curve. Um, uh, again, but uh, the, the lumbosacral region is going to be non-structural, which again is a, is a problem because obviously the, the lumbosacral area here is, is an area of disease, right? Because uh, there's subluxation and most likely there's some stenosis on MRI. But um, my point being is, you know, I think you can get the same amount of information from one single AP x-ray instead of getting two side benders. So less radiation. And to me, it's more information. Also, the patient stays in the same plane. They stay balanced. So that's why I like it better. Um, but that's, yeah, that's personal preference. But again, I think over time, a lot of, you know, surgeons are starting to use a single AP. I know the ISSG now is using it in our new complex adult deformity study. That's the, the, um, um, coronal plane uh, flexibility assessment of choices, the supine AP, not the side benders. And honestly, I don't get side benders on these patients anymore. I just get a single supine AP. Yeah, I don't I actually, this was the only case I could find that had these. I don't see these very often when they come across. So right. I wanted to grab this one because they actually did have them. So Griffin, okay. did you have anything else about this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there, there was one other question a little bit earlier about um, prone x-rays. So had you ever considered, uh, you know, having uh, it be a prone x-ray since it would be obviously what you would see in the operating room, um, but, you know, given, you know, sort of ease of patient access, radiology issues, what, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, when I uh, actually, actually um, so my uh, uh, partner, Keith Bridwell, did get prone x-rays at WashU, and I can tell you that the issue is that as patients get older, it's sometimes uncomfortable for they, them to lay prone on a hard cassette. And so they would kind of be moving sometimes during the x-ray. And when I tried it, I, I saw too much movement often. So that's why I went back to supine uh, because it's just, it was just easier for the patient to get and easier for them to just get one x-ray and be done with it. So, but you're right. Ideally, you're right. Prone would be an optimal thing. Ideally, prone on, a, on whatever frame, you know, if you're using an OSI frame, that would be the best x-ray to get, right? Get a prone image on OSI 
a frame pre-op um, uh, would be the best um, uh, uh, assessment and correlation to intraoperative imaging. But, um, but again, that's, so that's why I went back to supply and Griffin. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, one, one last point that I'll make before Wendy shows the last film and, and uh, we'll finish up is, you know, the one, one thing I took away from your office, uh, you know, both you and Dan is, you know, you guys do a great physical exam, regardless of whether it's a new patient or, or whether it's a follow-up. But I still use your trick of asking the patient to get on the table and lie on their stomach. Right. And if they're not able to get on the table and lie on their stomach, they're probably not healthy enough to have a spinal reconstruction surgery. That's a pretty, that's a, that's a linky tip. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's not substantiated. There's no data on that, but it's kind of makes sense. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I do use that, as Griffin knows, I do use that rule. Uh, and people that can't do that by themselves, I really uh, have hesitation doing an elective spinal deformity operation on a patient if they can't get on the uh, exam table by themselves, putting themselves prone. Yeah, no question. Well, Wendy, you want to show us the... You all were so busy in surgery today, you might not have seen it, but on Twitter, I posted a nice a paper by one of my friends who does um, vertebroplasty, a nice paper on vertebroplasty for patients who couldn't get surgery for deformity correction for whatever reason. Sure. That can help a little bit, so... That's great. Um, yeah, well, so I can show this. I don't, don't... That's how it was corrected. I don't know. Yeah, so... Not my uh, case, so... Well, um... You know, maybe uh, Dr. Lenke, you can make a few comments, but uh, to save you a little bit yeah. of exposure, maybe I'll, I'll make a few comments about this. But, um, you know, obviously uh, this was treated with what looks like a, a T4 uh, down to the sacrum uh, with uh, S2AI screws. It does look like there are uh, four rods across the bottom and uh, looks like a two level A lift and then maybe a two level T lift. Um, so, uh, you know, inner body work done at multiple levels in the lumbar spine. You know, I think, uh, you know, the one thing that's interesting about this is I think it kind of speaks to um, some of the problems often without getting the supine imaging um, is that uh, oftentimes you can think you need more, uh, but maybe it's not exactly what you see. And so as you start to plan and, and uh, you know, make your decisions about how much you're going to try and get at each level, uh, you end up uh, over or under shooting. You know, the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, I think uh, this patient definitely had some... Uh, some hyperkyphosis, and uh, I would worry just based on the posterior skull line alone uh, whether this might uh, progress to a PJK. Uh, but uh, you know, overall, I, I don't think it's uh, horrible. As as Dr. Lenke said earlier, I would say it's pretty acceptable. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, the most important thing is how how the patient is doing, which unfortunately we don't have that follow up from the X-rays. All right. Maybe Griffin can over, that, that... over my screen because I can't get the button to give you control of my screen. No problem. Dr. Linke, any, any, uh, any final thoughts or, or pearls for our listening audience? We've had a, a great group today and I've actually uh, gotten messages from a couple more who said that they uh, missed it, but are, can't wait for it to be on YouTube. Great. Oh, thanks, Griffin. I think, uh, you know, again, uh, organizing classification of points being, as, as John Dubesay told me uh, when I presented him the AIS system, he said, I really need to don't agree with all your criteria of the 25 degree structural criteria. He said that is irrelevant. What he said is the key is it forces you to measure all the x-rays and look at the, the radiographs in more detail. So you're not going to miss anything. And I think maybe the, the same thing can come out of this system that, you know, if you start using supine images, you're going to start realizing that there is some benefit uh, to that. And you obviously, you know, measure the lumbosacral fractional curve uh, you know, uh, and, and just start thinking about it. And so you won't miss a structural curve when, when you, um, have it, or and maybe you won't miss an opportunity to not fuse it when you you know when you think you automatically need to fuse a, a first structural uh, non-structural curve. So uh, again, the more data you have, I think, and the more uh, time you spend just looking at these these X-rays, I think the, the the better surgeon you'll be. So that, that's that's the key. If, whether you use the criteria or not is a, to me is a less relevant, honestly. Yeah. 